Hello, my name is David Maxwell and I'm one of the application engineers in TI's battery management systems team. And what I'm going to talk about in these series of videos is single cell gauging 101. It's going to be broken into three separate videos. When we talk about gauging, this is mainly going to be covering lithium ion batteries, the standard type that you're probably used to for your uh, consumer electronics, your cell phones, tablets of various sorts, uh, but it's not only limited to that. Single cell lithium ion batteries are also used in a lot of different end applications like medical, uh, warehouse scanners, for example, radios, and, and a lot of different things. And when we talk about gauging, what we're meaning is how to tell what is left in your battery at any given time. Gauging is basically a predictive algorithm that will tell you how much runtime you have, but it can also be as simple as just when your battery is getting low. So you need to think about your application. Do you just want a, a early warning for the user that it, their battery is almost empty, or do you want to give them detailed information? For example, how much time they have left until their battery is going to die, or how much capacity in milliamp hours or watt hours, or do you want to tell them under different, different loadings how long they're going to have? How long can they talk? How long can they play a game? How long can the radio be on? And a, a really good gauge can also give you a lot of extra useful information. For example, the state of health of your battery that can tell you with a numerical value how old your battery is getting and when the battery needs to be replaced. And also, if it were fully charged, how much energy it would have in it. So as I mentioned, we're going to have three separate videos. This first video, we're going to talk about battery chemistry fundamentals. In the second one, we're going to look at some of the classic fuel gauging approaches, voltage-based and Coulomb counting. And then in the third video, we'll talk about impedance track and its benefits and all the extra value that it can add to your system. So let's get started with part one, battery chemistry fundamentals. On this slide, we're showing the discharge curves of a typical lithium ion battery. And on the left, you can see it's where it's fully charged. And typically, it will be 4.2 volts for most chemistries right now. And as you discharge it, and if you integrate the current, uh, this is how much you would get out of it. So at a very light load, 340 milliamp hours on this particular battery, you would hit 3 volts after about 1800 milliamp hours. Of course, a heavier load, you're going to have a higher drop in the battery and you're going to hit that voltage much earlier. The same thing happens if you use the same current, but you vary the temperature. So a warm battery, 45 degrees or 20 degrees, you're going to still get about the same amount of capacity. But as it gets colder, at freezing, for example, it's going to drop, the voltage will drop much quicker. If your system can go all the way down to 2.5, you might get the same amount of milliamp hours out of it. But most systems are going to actually stop at 3 or even 3.5 volts. So you can see the dramatic reduction in runtime if you have a cold temperature. This plot on the bottom shows how as the battery ages, after many, many cycles, the internal impedance is also increasing, and so you're going to get the same effect as the battery being very cold, and your voltage curve is going to drop very quickly. And so an aged battery can also give you much reduced runtime. So you can see if your system shuts down at 3.4 volts, you're going to get a lot less runtime, whether it's an old battery, a cold battery, or a heavily loaded battery. So a fuel gauge that is going to give you a good long runtime under all these different conditions should allow you to vary the shutdown voltage, and we'll talk about that later what in the, one of the benefits of impedance track. So now let's talk about what's going on inside the battery and how this applies to your system. One of the first figures we're going to talk about is the Qmax, which is the term we use for battery chemical capacity. And I also want to define, you might hear people talking about C rates or hour rates for a battery. So 
that's independent of the actual milliamp hours or watt hour rating of the battery. If someone says uh, a discharge rate of 1C, that means theoretically the current that would be required to completely discharge your battery in one hour. So for example, if you had a 2200 milliamp hour battery, a 1C discharge rate would be exactly 2200 milliamps. It would take you one hour in theory. Actually, you'd probably get less than that because of the internal impedance, but that's the nomenclature we use to refer to the current that's relative to the battery capacity. You might also hear of a half C rate or a C by two rate. That would be just divide the capacity by two and nominally that would be a two hour discharge. So here I've showed and read again the same voltage curve with a very light load. With a light load you'll get basically the, the maximum voltage. But because there is a IR drop, if you model the battery at the most simple level as a capacitor storing the charge and the internal impedance as a simple resistor, you're going to get an IR drop across the terminals. And so the actual voltage seen at the terminals is going to be lower than this. Another term you might hear us use through this presentation is EDV, end of discharge voltage. And that is going to depend on your application or the battery chemistry. It's not a good idea to discharge most lithium-ion batteries below 3 volts, and, but your system maybe requires 3.2 volts or 3.5 volts to operate. So that would be your EDV for your particular system. Whichever is the higher value would be your EDV. You might also hear it referred to as terminate voltage because that's when you need to terminate your discharge. So we talked about Qmax, which is how much you could get out of the battery at a very light load, theoretically. And so that's, you're never going to get more than that, of course. But QUs, or usable capacity, is going to depend on your IR drop of your battery. So the blue line is under a, some particular load current I, and using the internal impedance of the battery, you're going to have that drop, and you're going to hit your EDV at an earlier point. So that's what we call your QUs, or usable capacity. Higher the current, the lower the QUs. Also, the higher the EDV, or terminate voltage, the lower your usable capacity. So this resistance in a battery is a very important thing to understand. We showed it as a simple model of just a resistor, but actually it's a much more complex than that. It's really a function of temperature, as we showed in the previous slides. It also changes with state of charge depending on the, whether your battery is full or somewhere in the middle or empty. And of course, as it ages, the impedance is also going to go up. In general, for some typical batteries, it could even double after 100 cycles depending on how, how uh, hard those cycles are. And you also get, for brand new cells from the same production line, you might get some cell-to-cell -cell variation in that resistance. And then if you go to a different manufacturer, they're going to have a slightly different recipe, and you also get variation there. So it's not easy to model as just a simple resistor. And even if you try to model it across temperature and across state of charge, it's going to vary from cell to cell. And then it's completely unpredictable what it's going to do as the battery ages. So this is the key point that we're going to bring up again and again through this presentation, the resistance of the battery. But let's discuss some more terms here. State of charge, SOC, you might have heard before. And that's basically just the Q that you have left in your battery from a particular state. At this state A, you have this amount of charge left divided by your total available charge. That ratio Usually you think of it as percent. Maybe some of your devices will tell you have 95% remaining capacity in your battery. So it's just a relative term. It doesn't tell you how much runtime you have. It doesn't tell you how many milliamp hours or milliwatt hours you have. But it gives you a rough idea of how close to full or empty you are. Battery chemists also like to talk about DOD or depth of discharge, which is basically inverse of state of charge. So if you're at 100% or 1, 
state of charge, that would be zero DOD starting here at the beginning. But as you get to empty, that's fully discharged battery, so DOD is one, and the state of charge would be zero percent or zero if you're talking about a ratio. We mentioned before that the resistance of the battery is a function of a number of parameters and this graph shows how the temperature and state of charge affect the resistance. So if you start on the left with a fully charged battery, all these are showing that your resistance is relatively low, but as you discharge and get to empty, the discharge starts going up very quickly. Then if you compare each of these curves, let's look at the red one for zero degrees, you can see that the resistance is much higher than at even 10 degrees or at room temperature, uh, the green one, at 20 degrees. So the lower the temperature, typically below 15 degrees C, the resistance of your battery starts increasing very, very quickly. And so that's going to have a big effect on your runtime and also make a big challenge for your gauge if it's trying to predict the future. The other thing that can affect your resistance of the battery is the aging. And this slide shows a couple of different effects of aging. On the left we show with a very light load, let's assume on the first cycle you would get out this much and we'll normalize it to 100% battery capacity. After 100 cycles, it's gonna reduce and even at a very light load, which could ignore the internal impedance of the battery, you might only get 95% of the original capacity that you had and it's only going to go downhill from there. Now that's with a very light load, not even taking into account the impedance. So let's look at the impedance on the right. This is plotting the complex impedance, and let's just look at the DC impedance. Uh, in fact, most battery manufacturers, if you look at their data sheet, they're going to tell you the impedance of the battery at one kilohertz, which really isn't that useful for most applications if you have a continuous discharge. So Let's look at the low frequency closest to the DC impedance, just the real portion over here. And so you can see on the first cycle, it might be 150 milliohms, for example, where on the battery data sheet, it's gonna look a little bit better. And then they'll say, oh yeah, even after a lot of cycling, my one kilohertz impedance is still here, but really your DC impedance could have easily approached doubling after 100 cycles. And again, it's just going to continue getting worse and worse as, as it ages. This one, we're showing a slightly more complex battery model because there is a transient response to the battery when you apply a load. It's not an instantaneous IR drop. It's going to have some high frequency components and then turn into this DC resistance path a little bit after the load starts. But if you compare manufacturer one, these are a number of, this is the impedance spectra of a number of different cells. Again, we'll look at the low frequency. Let's look at the one millihertz. And so from left to right at the end of these tails, you can see a widespread in these resistances from the same manufacturer, say here between 0.13 and 0.15. Manufacturer two, nominally using the same recipe, the same uh, chemicals for making their lithium ion battery, their, their process might be slightly different. And so theirs could range for cells from the same manufacturing line, maybe from 0.11 to 0.13. So this, this deviation in resistance, if you just try to use voltage to, to tell your state of charge, is, could lead to a big state of charge error. And in the next, set of, in the next video, we're going to talk about how, where this comes from. Remaining capacity is another term that we'll use a lot. So state of charge is a relative term, what percent you have, but it doesn't tell you how much you actually have left. So remaining capacity is basically how many milliamp hours you have left until you hit empty or your EDV or your terminate voltage. So from state A, you might have this remaining capacity one, but at a higher load, you're still at the same starting point, but suddenly you increased your load, so your IR drop increased, 
or the temperature decreased, so your resistance increased. So that means either the I is getting bigger or the R is getting bigger, so it's going to drop more. That means you're going to get less capacity available before you hit your terminate voltage here. So different discharge rate or different temperature is going to cause you to have different remaining capacity. So this really means that your state of charge can also change with load and temperature, but usually a gauge or a system will try to hide that from the end user so they don't get confused with it jumping around. Let's wrap up this uh, battery chemistry review. Uh, Qmax is what we call the theoretical maximum battery chemical capacity with no load, and that's sort of your reference point. Qus is the usable capacity, and that's going to depend on your load and your temperature because of the internal impedance of the battery. And that battery resistance is causing the IR drop, which affects your usable capacity. State of charge is just a relative term, and you can determine that based on an open circuit voltage measurement. If the battery is well relaxed, you can just take a voltage measurement and get a relative state of charge. And we'll talk about that in the next video. Remaining capacity depends on your load, and this is usually milliamp hours, or it could be in milliwatt hours. And battery aging we showed affects the impedance and capacity both, and that's gonna have a big effect on your usable capacity and make it very challenging for the gauge to maintain accuracy as, it, as the battery ages. That's the end of the first video. In the next one, we're gonna talk about the classic fuel gauging approaches and what's good about them and some of the challenges with those, all in order to set us up for part three, which we'll be talking about impedance track fuel gauging and all the benefits that it has.